I'm educational justice coach, Lindsay Lyons. And here on the Time for Teachership podcast, we learn how to inspire educational innovation for racial and gender justice, design curricula grounded in student voice, and build capacity for shared leadership. I'm a former teacher leader turned instructional coach. I'm striving to live a life full of learning, running, baking, traveling, and parenting because we can be rock star educators and be full human beings. If you're a principal, assistant superintendent, curriculum director, instructional coach, or teacher who enjoys nerding out about co-created curriculum with students, I made this show for you. Here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 159 of the Time for Teachership podcast. Today, we're talking about grading for equity, specifically focused on competency-based rubrics. And we're also kicking off a mini series of episodes that are going to be focused on transforming the systems that uphold inequity in our schools. So again, today we're talking about competency-based learning and rubrics specifically as a tool for increasing equity in feedback and assessment in your school or district. Let's get to it. All right, so we're talking about grading for equity and specifically competency-based rubrics in this episode. So I first wanna start as usual with the why. Typical grading policies lead to grades that are often inconsistent, inequitable, and don't actually relate to the student's competency in a subject area, which is bananas. They also, incidentally, cause many students very high levels of stress. I have heard this, I have seen this firsthand in my students. It is not a fun thing. Grading itself, I would love to throw out the window. But if we have to do grades, let's talk about how we do grades well. So Hayset and Marzano, two researchers, in their study found teachers who measured skill growth over time using competency-based rubrics noted a 34% gain in student achievement versus traditional classrooms that do not use competency-based rubrics. 34% gain in student achievement. Yes, I will take that. Also in competency-based classes, students showed increased student learning, less stress in the class, along with better teacher-student relationships, always what we're going for. I have heard so many teachers and leaders say that their teachers really want better relationships with students and also a decreased grade achievement gap. So again, if we're focused on equity as the goal, there is a decreased grade achievement gap in the use of competency-based rubrics and competency-based learning and teaching. So super good. And a couple more things just off the top of my head here, but if you're not grading for students' competencies in subject-specific skills, like what are you actually grading for? Very likely it's a student's ability to memorize, fill out a worksheet, or have their butt in a seat. It's a little tongue-in-cheek, but I have seen it happen and I've even done it shamefully, as an early career teacher before I knew better, so to speak, right? Before I really saw it in action and saw the possibilities for how to do it. So that's my error. I have made the mistake. Learn from me and learn from this episode and the blog post that's going to come alongside it. And as we move into rubric specifically, I just want to say what's helpful to learning is actually feedback, not necessarily grades. Again, we could do away with grades completely, and I think we would be better off. But feedback is critical. And what rubrics do is provide the language on the rubric itself that gives us the specificity of feedback where students can identify, oh, this is why I'm not completely meeting the standard right now. This is the difference between my work and that exemplar work, right? It also kind of intrinsically, but you could also make it extrinsic or um, I guess I'm meaning implicit and explicit, implicitly, uh, but you can make it explicit it provides actionable next steps for how to improve. So how to make it explicit, I think I have done this in the past where I have taken a maybe YouTube tutorial on on if, for example, the skill was something like grammar. Um, I would use like a three minute YouTube video that already exists, or I could create one on my own. And I would link it into uh, the rubric to say like, hey, if you weren't quite there yet, um, this is a common challenge that a lot of you face here's what I want you to do. I want you to watch this three minute video. And if I find that I've been seeing the same challenge over and over again, just to embed it right into the rubric um, is I think a lot, a lot more effective, both for students to immediately get that feedback and to have a next step, but also for the teacher to be like, I don't have to share this with individual students. I can just say, if you got this on the rubric, it's going to save me time from one-on-one telling each student like, oh, this is the issue. And now you can go ahead and watch this video, right? It's just embedded in the ongoing rubric I use for every assessment. Okay, so how do we do this? 
step one, I would ask teachers to reflect. This is so powerful because often we don't even have a moment to just pause and reflect on our grading practices. So here are some sample questions that I totally pulled from Competency Collaborative. And I love Competency Collaborative's work. I will link to them. And I, I do think that you know, using their resources is awesome. And a lot of the language that I use in this episode probably pulls from them because I just use their resources so often. And they are who trained me and helped train me in uh, competency-based education and rubric practices. So here are some sample questions that you can use with your staff. One, how do you know whether and how much each student is learning based on what evidence? Two, how clear are your students about the criteria for success? Three, how do learners get actionable feedback in your class or school? Four, how do grades connect to and support learning at your school? Five, what are grades based on in your class or school? In an ideal world, what would grades be based on? Now, I also love inviting students and families to think about these questions. And so you might need to slightly adapt the literal text of each question, but I think you could have a really generative conversation and really identify similarities, differences, uh, directions for moving forward based on how everybody's answering the same types of questions. Now, step two, after you've had everyone reflect, now we're ready to kind of move into what do we do next with these reflections? Because likely there will be kind of many, I think, aha moments of, ooh, this feels wrong, but I'm just not sure what to do with this. And I've literally heard teachers say this to me. When we're reflecting on grading policies, like, I don't love this, but I also just don't have a better way. So what do you want me to do? Right. And, and fair, right? Like, so let's talk about what is step two. Step two would be to share the above research, right? All the stuff that we just talked about. And I say above because literally on the blog post, it's going to say above and then scroll up and you will see all of the research the links and all the things and the hallmarks of competency-based learning. So you want to give them all the info, the research that's like, yep, this is a good idea. But you also want to tell them like, what is competency-based learning? What is this direction we might be moving in? So three key points, I think, really define it. And again, these are pulled from Competency Collaborative. They have a lot more. I, I like these um, just because I think they really illuminate the, the stark differences and the things that people... Uh, struggle the most with and also benefit the most from when they switch over. So first, teachers have transparent learning outcomes, right? They inform their lessons and assessments, these outcomes do, and the outcomes become built out into a rubric inclusive of the criteria and expectations for how to meet them. And those rubrics, that language, the criteria, the expectations, all the things that's shared with students, right? This not only helps students to know what's coming, reduce anxiety, have clear expectations, all the things, but it also helps teachers, right? It helps teachers to plan more efficiently and effectively. Everything is backwards planned from those outcomes and the rubric itself. Now, secondly, when giving feedback around a specific competency under competency-based learning and teaching, the teacher is giving also a specific next step for how to improve. So this feedback is supposed to be useful and timely. This is really helpful for me as a teacher in, in my teacher hat, right? Like I'm thinking, okay, so this means I don't have to give all the feedback at once. So if there's like four things happening right now that I want to tell a student, do this different, do this different, do this, that's going to be overwhelming to the student. And it's also going to take me a ton of time to communicate, to teach, to find a resource for if I'm not actively teaching that student one-on-one, -on -one, but need them to watch a YouTube video or something. Instead, I can focus on the first next step. And again, this is also super helpful for your students to just focus on one thing at a time. It's going to move them along the learning progression faster to focus on one thing at a time. And now the third key hallmark I would say is that assessments are opportunities to demonstrate competency over time. This is a huge mindset shift. So we have to think of assessment as an ongoing dialogue. And this is language again from Competency Collaborative, ongoing dialogue and not a one and done act. So this is gonna shift how we plan, how we assess students, how we think about assessing students. If students will be revising their first try on an assessment or doing a lot of similar assessments, this is also super helpful for educators, right? Not only does it help the students, it helps the teachers because now they have to create fewer assessments, right? And they have to create fewer rubrics because we're just working on the same ones. And if we're not working on the exact same ones, they're still very similar 
in their construction, in what they're assessing, in the kind of um, fabric of the assessment itself, right? And we're just pulling in different content. But the fabric, the skill, the types of questions, the rubric itself, they all say the same. So much less work. All right, so in these steps, we have reflected. We have asked teachers to reflect, stakeholders to reflect. We've shared the research. We've talked about what competency-based learning is. I think you're going to start to generate a lot of excitement about this. And the next thing that you want to do, step three, is to consider what categories of competency you want to have in your rubrics, in your language, in how you grade if you're shifting the actual grading structure as well as a school or a department or even if you're an individual teacher, right? Or you're a leader who's kind of helping an individual teacher or a set of, small set of teachers to pilot something, like you still want to think about these and have kind of a shared discussion about them. I don't think there is a right answer to this, like how many categories of competency. I have seen four as the most typical. I have seen five. I have seen three. I think those are probably the range of three to five is probably what you want to go for. But one example Competency Collaborative has shared can be remembered with the acronym NAME, N-A-M-E. And that is all around this idea of competencies, right? So not yet, approaching, meeting, and exceeding the competency, right? So I have not yet got there. I am approaching, so I'm almost there. I'm meeting it, and I am above and beyond. I'm exceeding it. So that is something that you can use. You can switch it up in the language. You can... I mean, I've even, you know, like I said, I had people use just the first three because they feel uncomfortable saying that like the A, if you're, again, I think this is very still traditional minded, but like if you're thinking about the A as exceeding, like do you need to go above and beyond what I am asking of a grade level performance to get an A or should an A be just like, yeah, you met the standard, right? So there's a ton of discussion embedded in this and also a ton of traditional mindset that kind of comes through for better or for worse. Um, and I, I think that that's like a really cool discussion that you can have and a really powerful one that kind of unearths a lot of the deep-seated beliefs that are gonna inform what you're going to decide on. Now, another option is that you can use a visual non-linguistic category name. So I use bicycles. <laughs> and so I'll link to that in the blog post, the freebie for this episode is my skills-based rubric templates. And if you've gotten this before, I've recently, somewhat recently updated this. So you can see the first page is actually a learning progression version where you're not actually saying this skill is uh, you know, not yet approaching or meeting the standard, but it's actually like, here is the stepping stone skill or the supporting skill that you need to learn before you get to the next one, before you get finally to the skill itself. So for example, before I can analyze, I need to first decode the text. What is the text telling me? Then I need to be able to understand or comprehend the text and make sense of it. And then I can analyze and add my own spin and interpretation, right? So play with those. There's a bunch of different templates. That's why it's plural. Um, but this is going to be located on the blog post version of this podcast episode, which will be located at lindsaybethlyons.com slash blog slash 159. So in that, I, I said it's a bicycle. It's like the first category is like just a bicycle. That's it. Standing still, took it out of the garage, so to speak. The next one is looking like a kind of a, a family member, like a parent maybe uh, pushing a child on a bike, right? So you have kind of the quote unquote training wheels or I can do this with support category. And then the final one is like a bike going on like a mountain bike ride or something, right? So I can do this on my own. I'm doing tricks with it. This is great. So just an option, I've seen many, and you can Google, like Pinterest has a ton of cool visuals of people using like competency-based uh, scales that are actually like in visual metaphor format. Um, so, okay, once you've decided the categories of competency, step four is to use team time, super important that you have ongoing team time, department-wide or grade team-wide, however you do teams, to create subject-specific rubrics. So I would ask each department or subject team to create I think first you want to select like four to eight is usually the range I suggest discipline specific or subject specific skills that are like, we teach the, these regardless of the unit we're in, regardless of the grade level, these transcend contexts and grades. And once you choose them, have them select, um, uh, the, sorry, select the four to eight and then have them define, excuse me, which category they're going to start with. I like starting with the definition of like the highest. So 
whether that's exceeding or meeting standards, the bike on the mountain, whatever, this is what it looks like when it's great. And then kind of work backwards from there. And then define each category of competency. I would start because you're across grades here, I would start with the highest grade level. So if you're doing like K-5, start with a fifth grade and then work backwards to K. Um, if you're, you know, K-12, same same thing. I would start with 12, work backwards, but you might want to band it as well. So you might say that actually um, K-5, this is what competency looks like across, like across levels. Um, maybe we're not getting super specific. If you're doing K-12 and then within K-5 teams, you can get even more specific later, but to have a banded, here's elementary school, middle school, high school, what each of these looks like would also be a great resource to have and definitely a good place to start without getting too granular in the K-12 space. Step five is to have teachers use these shared rubrics for every single assignment. So for summative assessments, they're using the whole rubric, which is all of the skills, four, eight, whatever they came up with. This also is going to help teachers once again to design assessments that align with the complete rubric, right? So if they're like, I designed this assessment, but actually it doesn't have the ability to assess these three skills, well, we're going to redesign the assessment. Or we're going to rethink, like, is this actually a skill that gets assessed all the time? Does it need to be on the core rubric that's shared across the department? Now, for formative assessments, teachers can use one row of the shared rubric. So they're just taking the row of the rubric that has the specific skill the student is demonstrating competency in within that formative assignment. So again, you can use it for all assignments. You just not might, might not be using all of the rubric for every assignment. You're taking a piece here and there. But summative, again, I think I would do the full thing. Okay, final tips before I leave you. And really implications for teaching is what this section should be. So to ensure students have time to revise and improve their skills, based on feedback that they got from the, their last assessment, I would make sure teachers embed regular sessions. They can call them workshop days. I believe Competency Collaborative has somebody call them upgrade days um, into the course. So I used to do workshop days every Friday. Um, I've also called them what I need or win days. Like every Friday, win day, you get to work on whatever you need to work on. Check your last assessment for you know, whatever feedback that you got, where is a skill you didn't get meets standards or meets the competency on your rubric, work on it, given the resource bank of things that I have either linked in your rubric or have given you and revise that assessment or work on something else. This is great because students having the feedback can then determine which activities will be best for them based on the feedback. You don't have to go around and say, okay, you're here and you're here right? They know or should be able to internalize that as you work through this. Maybe not the first week, but by the first, second month, right? End of the first month, end of the second month, they're going to be cruising, right? Because they know this is how we do things. I'm used to this rubric. I've seen it many times. Another beautiful thing about this is that students can ask their friends, their peers for feedback because all the students are familiar with the rubric language. They learn and get familiar with this as a class. And what this does is it frees up the teachers to be what competency collaborative folks have called a cognitive coach. So I, as the teacher can meet, I can talk one-on-one -on -one in small conferences uh, with groups of students. I can help coach students versus teach or talk at students, right? It's like, okay, here's our struggle. You have the instructional video. You had the instruction from the lesson the day before. I can coach you on any sort of confusion, same as I do with instructional coaching, right? Anytime I have shared an idea or a practice or a resource and teachers have tried it out, have come back to me said, this didn't work. Okay, let's figure out why and where do we go to next? So we're truly in coach mode, which is far more effective. It's a far more valuable use of our time, especially when we have things like YouTube videos and things that are already out there, especially when we have already delivered, so to speak, the initial new content lesson in a lecture, in a video, however we did it the first time. Students had that opportunity. Now they need something different, right? And that's what it frees us up to do. And in terms of pacing, also a big shift for teachers is going to be moving from that coverage mindset of speed and breadth, like more is better, right? To prioritizing less is better. We're doing deep learning. We're doing a uh, hard focus on skills that transfer across contexts and content areas, right? This is likely something, both of these, the cognitive coach idea and the pacing for depth of overbreath, 
likely something that you as a leader have wanted that maybe many of your teachers have wanted to shift to, but the development of the competency-based rubrics is going to be the tool that really helps you get there. All right, try it out and I'll meet you back here next week. If you like this episode, I bet you'll be just as jazzed as I am about my coaching program for increasing student-led discussions in your school. Shane Safir and Jamila Dugan talk about a pedagogy of student voice in their book, Street Data. They say students should be talking for 75% of class time. Do students in your school talk for 75% of each class period? I would love for you to walk into any classroom in your community and see this in action. If you're smiling at yourself as you listen right now, grab 20 minutes on my calendar to brainstorm how I can help you make this big dream a reality. I'll help you build a comprehensive plan from full day trainings and discussion protocols like Circle and Socratic Seminar to follow up classroom visits where I can plan, witness, and debrief discussion-based lessons with your teachers. Sign up for a nerdy, no strings attached brainstorm call at lindsaybethlyons.com slash contact. Until next time, leaders, think big, act brave, and be your best self. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at teachbetter.com slash podcasts, and we'll see you at the next episode.